You know the story about Philadelphia during the American Revolution. That scrappy band of men who forged a new nation, emerging from Independence Hall that hot July summer's day to declare, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, that's not this story. Revolutions are messy, and the American Revolution was no exception. When you overthrow one system, there's a period of time when anything seems up for grabs. What kind of country were we going to be? Who held the power? And what happens when we disagree with each other and with those in power? Our young nation struggled with these issues on Philadelphia streets, fracturing along long existing fault lines. And the turmoil following the revolution played out during a truly horrific public health crisis that would drive long-term changes to our city streets. This is Found in Philadelphia, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Philadelphia's past so that we can better understand the present. Because our history matters. I'm your host, Lori Ament. With each episode, I hope that you'll learn something new, see things a little differently, and be inspired to go explore some of this history for yourself right here in the city of brotherly love. This is the third episode in a series about the history of Philadelphia streets. If you haven't listened to the other episodes, you miss hearing about Philly streets in the earliest days and their development in the 1700s. Before we get on with the story, I wanna tell you about an upcoming event. The Found in Philadelphia podcast and Beyond the Bell Tours are planning an in-person history tour this July. We've been wanting to do something together for a while, but there was a pandemic. Stay tuned to future episodes for more details about how you can join us and explore some of this history together. In the last episode, we learned about some of the earliest days on Philadelphia streets how the freshly laid out town grew into a haphazard colonial city where slavery prospered and the city struggled to maintain safe, clean streets. Despite early efforts to organize night watchmen, street lighting, paving, and regular trash collection, Philadelphia entered the American Revolution during a period of incredible growth. The city's population increased from around 19,000 in 1760 to about 30,000 in 1775. People still lived in crowded living conditions, densely packed into an arc along the edge of the Delaware River. The streets were barely developed beyond 7th Street. Overseas trading was still the main economic driver for the city, and people needed to live close to where the jobs were, along the docks of the Delaware. We left the city on the brink of the American Revolution. So let's get into it. We may know a lot about the history of the American Revolution as a series of battles and retreats and fiery speeches, but what was the Revolutionary War like for regular people living in Philadelphia? How did the war impact day-to-day life on the streets? Well, Philadelphia streets were the stage for many dramatic moments during the Revolution that liberated the 13 colonies from Britain and established the young United States of America. This era saw the street as contested space with a vengeance. There was violence, but also political theater with demonstrations and parades and counter demonstrations. But in between were many long years of war that disrupted people's lives and fractured the community. The city was home to a population with divided loyalties during the American Revolution. There were wealthy merchants and artisans who remained faithful to the British. American patriots from all classes, Quaker friends who refused to support any war, free and enslaved Black people who were offered liberty by the British, plus a great number of poor and working class residents who were caught in between. And the street was where they all met. So while the founding fathers were debating the revolution indoors in the State House, in what we now call Independence Hall, The rest of the city took the debate to the city streets. Members of all classes took part in public processions that involved hanging or burning effigies of hated public figures. They conducted mock funerals for the death of liberty. 
Mobs humiliated captured British officials and sympathizers using tactics like tarring and feathering, which was a lowly sailor's punishment. After the Declaration of Independence was read to the public in the summer of 1776, July 4th became a day to show patriot loyalty, by force if necessary. On July 4th, in wartime Philadelphia, patriots showed their solidarity by placing candles in their windows. And if you didn't have a candle in your window, you risked having your window smashed by roving mobs of young men. Many homes without candles belonged to Quaker friends. Their objections to war, to fighting in any form, made them suspicious. This was no time to be neutral. Plus, Quaker friends tended to be wealthier citizens and were resented for that as well. And things really started to heat up when it appeared that the British were about to take the city in 1777. Patriot families fled in advance of the British troops. The streets were filled with an endless procession of wagons and carriages heading away from the city. It's estimated that 10% of Philadelphia homes were abandoned. Before the British took over the city, American troops marched through the streets with drums, knocking on doors and demanding that all military-aged men join the fight. With the British drawing near and the sounds of cannon and gunfire in the distance, wealthy Quaker men were arrested and imprisoned for possible treason. Crowds gathered on the street to watch the guards, aided by a mob, roughly forced these Quakers into wagons that would take them away to be held in Virginia. Many had their families standing by, watching this humiliation, not knowing when they'd see each other again. The British captured and occupied Philadelphia for seven months, over the winter of 1777 and into the spring of 1778. This was a strange interlude of extravagance and devastation. Loyalists joined the officers in elegant celebrations, while other citizens were forced to house British officers and guard their horses and food and firewood from marauding British soldiers at night. When it no longer made sense to hold the city, the British prepared to depart, leaving a trail of wreckage and just plain old vandalism in their wake. In June 1778, the streets of Philadelphia witnessed another exodus as those who had aided the British retreated from the city. As the British left, Black people had to make a decision stay and place their faith in the revolutionary spirit shown by some in Pennsylvania, or follow to fight for the British and claim their offer of freedom without knowing exactly where this might lead them. Back in Patriot control, the streets of Philadelphia were grim. The common ground at the center of the city, where City Hall now stands, was a site for punishing British sympathizers in public. The penalty for treason was death by hanging. The cost of food spiked. Merchants who were accused of price fixing were paraded through the streets by a vigilante militia with a drum beating the rogues march. Even patriotic celebrations had a nasty edge. When news of the British surrender at Yorktown in October 1781 arrived in the city, celebrations in the streets turned violent as the mob targeted Quaker homes, shouting threats, breaking windows and doors, and beating up any Quaker men they could get their hands on. Following the war, it took many years to rebuild. Philadelphia had suffered during the British occupation and the following years of struggle. Streets were ruined. Hundreds of houses had been torn down, and most trees had been cut for firewood. On top of that, the country was suffering from its first economic depression. There was very little money to invest in rebuilding. Unfortunately, the citizens of the city were largely on their own as they rebuilt, because government was unsettled, to say the least. But Philadelphia was where the government came to get settled. The city's war-torn streets were the dynamic center of political life for the young nation. City, state, and national governments were all being debated and rewritten right here in Philadelphia. The federal constitution was debated and written here in 1787, Pennsylvania's state constitution was rewritten here in 1790. Philadelphia's own charter was also revised and amended in 1789 and 1796. And all of this new legislation was being tested here because for a decade, from 1790 to 1800, Philadelphia served as the seat of government for the city, the state of Pennsylvania, and the capital of the newly created federal government of the United States of America. 
So what were the streets like in the early Republic? Philadelphia's population grew much more slowly during the war and its aftermath. The population settled along the Delaware was just over 30,000 on the brink of war. The population hit about 44,000 in 1790, but then grew to 67,000 by 1800. Philadelphia's free black population was growing during these early years of the nation as well. Pennsylvania's gradual emancipation bill of 1780 made Philadelphia an attractive place to settle. At the time of the revolution, 80% of the approximately 1,600 black Philadelphians were counted as slaves. But by 1800, less than 1% of the over 6,000 African Americans in the city were enslaved. The city's residents crammed into small houses on densely populated streets and alleys close by the river. It's kind of hard to get your head around just how dense the city was back then. By 1800, the city's population density ranged from 50,000 people per square mile to as much as 93,000 people per square mile near the Delaware docks. Just to put that in perspective, today, Philadelphia's average population density is 11,000 people per square mile, with Center City and its tall buildings at double that average, around 22,000 people per square mile. At 93,000 people per square mile, the population density of some of the blocks along the Delaware in 1800 was higher than that of modern-day Mumbai, India, the world's most densely populated city. People in Philadelphia still tended to live all jumbled together. They lived their lives within walking distance of their homes because during this time, people and goods moved through the city by muscle, whether that be people, horse, or some other animal. So you wanted to live near where you worked and where you could buy food. This meant that most blocks of the city had a mix of uses. Houses where people lived, next to buildings where people made things, close by stables for horses. Different classes of people lived in close proximity to each other. Wealthier residents lived in larger homes on the main streets, while poorer citizens and the newly arrived lived in small backyard houses and alley tenements. Philadelphia had a significant number of the working poor, estimated to be a third or as much as one half of the city's residents. These families could only make ends meet if both husband and wife brought in an income. They often lived on the edge of needing charity to get by. These back streets provided extra space for work, whether it was doing laundry or doing piecework. But because Philly's blocks were a mix of classes, even on the more fashionable blocks, these bustling, overflowing back alleys were very close by. In the city, houses gave right out onto the street or alleyway. So immediately after stepping outside of your door, you would enter a very social space. The street was a place for kids to play, a place to socialize with your neighbors, either gathering on the footway around a water pump or formally promenading down the center of the street on a Sunday. The streets were also a place for business, where peddlers brought their wares to people's homes. Hucksters, who were often women, sold food. Domestic servants ran errands, and laborers looked for work. The desperate begged on the streets or scavenged for anything they could resell. The streets were also a place to exchange information, where news was passed among neighbors or by posted bills. At night, large translucent screens called illuminations were like early billboards. The large screens were painted with images and slogans mounted on buildings and lit up from behind. And the city of Philadelphia did eventually pass a series of legislation surrounding its streets in the 1790s and established the city commissioners for streets in 1797. Similar provisions were made for the fast growing districts of Southwark and Northern Liberties. The commissioners were responsible for repairing and cleaning streets and also for enforcing the requirements that citizens pave the footways and cartways in front of their buildings. Once again, residents were responsible for paving the street in front of their homes. The city also created a survey department to confirm that streets were built according to city standards. Streets were to be cleaned at least once a week. And you can envision what this process looked like when it was stated that streets were to be quote, scraped once a week. With all of the horse traffic, the streets would be quickly covered with muck, 
which was rich enough to be sold at auction as fertilizer at one time. It was in Philadelphia's crowded, bustling, and muck-filled streets that the young government and city residents began to work out what national traditions should look like. There were official celebrations held in the streets of the city to display the young government's power and unity and, above all, order. These were carefully crafted, government-organized events that began with ringing church bells and firing cannons out on the river. Then orderly groups of men paraded through the streets with musical bands, wearing matching clothing that identified them as skilled workers, militiamen, clergymen, or government representatives. These types of events were held to celebrate the ratification of the Constitution and the first Thanksgiving Day in Philadelphia. The intent was to present a unified republic with each element in its proper order and place and to give a respectful, powerful backdrop for government dignitaries. The all-important order of these events was so critical to communicate that the parade lineup would be carefully published in the newspapers. We were pretty much making it up as we went along, so these public displays were important. But it wasn't all about unity in the early Republic. Philly streets had plenty of opposing voices. And finding a place for these voices helped shape what democracy should look like in the new Republic. Philadelphia saw the emergence of the first national political parties, known as the Federalist and Democratic Republican parties. These parties were divided over a fundamental question for the young country. As Philadelphia's radical Aurora newspaper put it, quote, the contest was no longer that of resistance against foreign rule, but which of us shall be the rulers? The Federalists preferred the new nation to be led by elites from a centralized federal government. And this was reflected in their orderly parades of well-dressed dignitaries. The Democratic Republicans wanted the power to be shared more broadly by the citizenry with more local control. And their events tended to attract a rowdier and less well-turned-out crowd. They rejected the trappings of pomp and circumstance. These political parties were new to the nation, but they reflected long-standing divisions between the well-to-do and the working class in Philadelphia. Philadelphia had plenty of members on both sides of the new political divisions. The Federalists were in power and headed by influential men like Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, and most importantly, George Washington. These were the men crafting those official government parades but there was plenty of popular support for the Democratic Republicans. Over 40 Democratic Republican societies formed in the city during the spring of 1793 alone. Their members were predominantly craftsmen from the better off among the working class, and many were veterans of the war. They felt that they were fighting for the true Republican heart of the revolution. These men felt a great bond with the radicals of the French Revolution. They wore those soft, pointed liberty caps and red, white, and blue badges in solidarity. They created a new calendar of public celebrations around the French Revolution and often sang the Marseillaise in Philly streets. Both of these groups, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, had very different ideas about what type of country they had fought the war for, and their disagreements spilled over into the national celebrations in Philadelphia's streets. A major flashpoint was July 4th celebrations in Philadelphia. Independence Day had always been particularly important in Philadelphia. But in the 1790s, the political parties had fundamental differences over what, in fact, we were celebrating on July 4th. For the Federalists, July 4th was another event to praise the men in power and government. But for the Democratic Republicans, Independence Day was about rededicating the country to abstract ideals of liberty. So in order to emphasize their particular positions, the political parties begin to split off into their own separate post-party celebrations after the officially sanctioned public parades were over. The Federalists held their events at expensive hotels, giving toasts to the great men of the revolution, while the Democratic Republican supporters celebrated in the streets, offering a more public and often rowdier alternative. 
In 1795, Democratic Republicans held their first counter-demonstration on July 4th to openly protest the signing of the Jay Treaty by the U.S. government. The Jay Treaty gave large concessions to the British in order to broker a peace deal, and it ended the American alliance with revolutionary France. The Democratic Republicans signaled their disapproval with a silent procession carrying an effigy of John Jay, who was a prominent Federalist and diplomatic envoy to Great Britain. The procession led north into Kensington, where the effigy was burned. A company of volunteer militia tried to end this non-sanctioned protest, but it was attacked with stones. Philadelphia inspired other communities to hold their own popular 4th of July celebrations in support of liberty, not just in support of the current government. By 1800, the Democratic Republicans had taken over the federal government with the election of Thomas Jefferson, and they centered the July 4th celebration around the reading of Jefferson's most famous work, the Declaration of Independence, which is something that's stuck with us until today. And just to be clear, both sides agreed that political power, just like these public events, was only proper for white men. White women could watch from a discreet distance. They might be able to voice their opinions in letters or in the privacy of their own homes, but they were never allowed to actually take part in any formal street celebrations, regardless of political party. So even though the Democratic Republicans professed their faith in liberty, they were really only thinking about liberty for white men who are not part of the wealthy elite. But the Federalists thought the Democratic Republican ideas of liberty were dangerous. Where would this cult of liberty end? If the country extended power to working class white men, there was a whole bunch of disenfranchised people standing in line behind them, waiting for their turn. Black men, all women, the poor, the homeless, they would all be asking for political power next. And there were examples of where these dangerous ideas might lead. And you could see it on Philadelphia streets. In the early Republic, Black men were reported to be brazenly parading through the streets on July 4th. They were celebrating their own version of liberty. And they were deliberately questioning the young nation's claims of liberty and justice for all. Their mock militia marches were in celebration of the Haitian Revolution of 1791, when the enslaved successfully revolted against the white population. The leaders of this revolt used the language of the French Revolution, which echoed the language of the Declaration of Independence. Hundreds of French-speaking enslaved refugees had arrived in Philadelphia from Haiti, and white people were afraid that the Black Haitians, known as San Domingans, were spreading ideas of fiery insurrection in Philadelphia. They were extremely fearful of allowing Black people to celebrate freedom on their streets. But these Black men armed themselves with bludgeons and swords and marched to the streets on July 4th anyway. They were ready to rough up anyone who got in their way claiming that they would make them remember San Domingo. So public marches by the Black community were often met with violence. It could be seen as a provocation for a Black person just to be out on the street on July 4th in Philadelphia. Here's another example of a marginalized group of people standing up for their rightful place in Philadelphia streets and using the language of the revolution as justification. This story involves poor working women, both Black and white, who eked out a living selling small bits of goods on city streets, especially in the streets outside the public market sheds. I mentioned them earlier. They were called hucksters. They sat on makeshift chairs and benches, selling goods out of large straw baskets. These women had very limited options to earn an independent living, but hucksters were considered a nuisance by many, and the city cracked down on their trade in the 1790s. But the women refused to go away and they organized resistance in the courts and in a petition, claiming that banning them from the marketplace violated their political rights. In a city where Democratic Republicans were pushing for a more egalitarian form of democratic government, the hucksters' language resonated. The hucksters' petition gained over 500 signatures and won them back their places in the market by the state legislature. But in Philadelphia, the hucksters continued to be a target. As women seen in public, engaging in commerce and pushing for their rights, they were considered to be unfeminine and dangerous. Huckstering was seen as a gateway to prostitution. The city continued to arrest and fine the hucksters. The women vendors petitioned again, 
asking to be offered a legitimate space at the public market, rather than being pushed to its fringes. They wanted the city to give the weakest members of society an equal opportunity to earn a living. The city refused this request, but still, these women persisted, moving operations to nearby alleyways or taking to the streets in the neighborhoods, carrying their goods in baskets on their arms or on top of their heads, even though they remained on the margins of society. But things changed in Philadelphia after 1800. The city was no longer the center of politics for the young nation. The Pennsylvania state capital had moved to Lancaster for a bit, and the nation's capital moved to its permanent home in Washington, D.C. Part of the reason that the seats of government moved out of Philadelphia was because the city was considered unhealthy, and with good reason. All of the political turmoil of the 1790s took place against a backdrop of recurring and devastating epidemics. The summers brought yellow fever to the port city where streets were already vulnerable from the overcrowded living conditions and poor sanitation. Outbreaks often crippled the city. It's pretty easy for us to imagine the fear of an unknown and invisible killer running rampant. Government and businesses closed. Those that could leaving the city those that couldn't, staying indoors, avoiding others on the empty streets. Many of those who could not leave were poor, and many were Black. The yellow fever outbreaks of Philadelphia got so bad that half of the population fled, and the sick were sometimes abandoned in the streets, refused entry to their own homes. In a city of 45,000, nearly a tenth of the population were believed to have died in 1793 alone the densely populated blocks near the Delaware were the hardest hit. But the streets also saw signs of compassion. The mayor organized a committee that risked their lives to patrol the streets to help the sick and enforce public hygiene. The growing free Black community of Philadelphia rallied to the call of their religious leaders and offered to help. Many dying after providing critical care for the sick and cleaning the streets when no one else would. Though many white residents resented having to pay Black people fair wages for their work in a time of crisis. But these citizen-led efforts were the few signs that the city had not been completely abandoned. Despite the heroic efforts of some citizens, fever epidemics plagued Philadelphia for decades. The carrier of yellow fever, the mosquito, would remain a mystery for the next hundred years. The city did establish mandatory public health inspections for all ships entering Philadelphia docks. And a permanent quarantine structure was built to house the sick outside of the city. That quarantine building, the Lazaretto, built in 1799, is still standing in Essington today. But there were some who believed that a cleaner city would improve public health. They focused on cleaner streets, cleaner water, and removing foul smells they called miasma, which were thought to pollute the air. In 1798, the city of Philadelphia embarked on a plan to provide wholesome water from the Schuylkill River on the west to the densely populated city blocks to the east. It was the first public water project in the nation, and it was the first utility to run under our city streets. The first public water system in Philadelphia was focused on Center Square, where City Hall now sits. And the whole system was powered by the latest technological innovation, the steam engine. Here's how it worked. One steam engine would pull water from the Schuylkill along pipes to Center Square. A second steam engine would push the water up into two storage tanks. You may remember that Thomas Holm had located this square at the highest point in Center City. So from here, the city's water would be distributed by gravity toward the Delaware through a series of wood log pipes that were installed under the city streets. Yes, I said wood log pipes. Water could be connected to private homes for a fee, which would fund the project. But Schuylkill water would also be distributed for free at public hydrants because they believed it was so important for the community's health. The hydrants would also serve the city by providing water for cleaning streets and in case of fire. Center Square was made beautiful by housing the steam engine and water storage tanks in a three-story, classically styled building, surrounded by gardens and fountains. It was all quite lovely. But it didn't work very well. The center square system was temperamental, leaky, and woefully inadequate, almost from the beginning. 
Plans were soon underway to build a new waterworks on the Schuylkill, the amazingly still standing Fairmount Waterworks. This waterworks ended up being water powered, harnessing the power of the Schuylkill River itself. A dam was built across the river to drive a huge 16 foot diameter water wheel, which pushed the water uphill into a large reservoir on the top of Fairmount. The Philadelphia Museum of Art sits on top of what was once that huge reservoir. From Fairmount, the water moved by gravity down to the rest of the city through iron pipes this time. The new Fairmount Waterworks was operational in 1822, and it was a resounding success. By 1853, a map showed the Fairmount Waterworks supplying water to almost all of the streets from the Schuylkill to the Delaware and south into the Queen Village neighborhood. The city became a much healthier place to live, and we've been tearing up our streets to fix utilities ever since. We've just dipped our toes into the 19th century in Philadelphia, and things only get more complicated on Philly streets. We'll start really unpacking everything that was going on in the 1800s in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Found in Philadelphia podcast. Please check out the podcast website to learn more, see what these streets might have looked like, and find a list of my sources. On a side note, if you have not been to the free and wonderful museum at the Fairmount Waterworks, you really need to check it out. This podcast was researched, written, hosted, recorded, and edited by me, Lori Ament. So all mistakes are my own. Surreal Tyendi is audio engineer extraordinaire and head of Drexel University's Mad Dragon Recording Studios.